You understand? I don't hate Nintendo. I hate what it's become. I hate the Poke monetization. In 1996, a small-time game designer named Satoshi Tajiri was at the critical moment of his career. Over the last half a decade, he'd turned an amateur video game fanzine called Game Freak into a bona fide game development studio, and for most of that time, he and his team had been working on a single game, a game so ambitious and resource-hungry that it almost bankrupted him and destroyed the studio. That game was the original Pokémon, and its humble origins were reflected in its design. Pokémon was a strange, quirky RPG with an offbeat sense of humor and simple but unique mechanics. It had a lot in common with Earthbound, the outlandish SNES game that tragically bombed in the U.S. and embarrassed everyone associated with it. But Tajiri had risked everything on Pokémon. If it suffered the same fate as Earthbound, both he and Game Freak would go down with it. As it turned out, though, Pokémon wasn't destined for failure. Far from it. Like Final Fantasy, it was a bet-the-farm decision that ended up paying off and guaranteeing the future of the studio that produced it. And just as Squaresoft became a monolith in the games industry, so did Game Freak and Pokemon. However, there's one big difference between these two examples. Squaresoft branched out into many different game genres, and today it's a large, diversified studio that produces all kinds of games along with Final Fantasy. Game Freak, on the other hand, with very few exceptions, has basically been making and remaking Pokemon for the last two decades. It's still a relatively small company. And ironically, the Pokémon brand is now much, much bigger than it is, despite the fact that without Game Freak, Pokémon wouldn't exist. By the time Ruby and Sapphire came out, Satoshi Tajiri had already stepped down from the director's chair. I don't think he was bored with making games. It's just that Pokémon by that point was already so big that one person couldn't control it anymore. Pokémon outgrew him, just as it's outgrown Game Freak since then. Pokémon today is absolutely huge, not as a game series, but as a brand. It recently passed Hello Kitty to become the most profitable media franchise in history, and the vast majority of its profits come not from games made by Game Freak, but from branded merchandise that the Pokémon Company is responsible for. Pokémon isn't just games. It's anime, toys, movies, Pez dispensers, glorified pedometers, and got milk ads. In fact, Pokémon, which outgrew both its creator and its original studio, may well be on its way to outgrowing Nintendo itself. At the same time, it's changing the way Nintendo makes decisions about game design, corporate branding, and resource management. And as Nintendo looks for ways to reproduce the success of Pokémon with its other brands, the whole company is being slowly and subtly Pokémonetized. So what is this Pokémonetization I keep banging on about? Basically, it's a phenomenon in which a company that once made many different kinds of products has one that becomes so successful that it becomes the company's main focus. This happens all the time outside the games industry. And in fact, even inside it, Nintendo is far from the most prominent example. You could easily call it Konamification or Valvefaction if you wanted to. Whatever you call it, here's how the process works. First, one of a company's brands becomes unexpectedly successful, generating large profits and giving a generous boost to the careers of the employees responsible for making it. Naturally, this success leads the company to create derivative products for the brand. In entertainment, this means sequels, spin-offs, and merchandise. If the brand has a lot of popular appeal, profits from these derivative products will quickly exceed what was made by the original. Producing more content for this brand takes a lot of money and a lot of people. Unless the company suddenly hires tons of new employees, which is pretty unlikely, staff members who used to work on other projects will have to be moved to the new flagship brand, and the budgets of other projects will be cut at the same time. But the influence of the popular brand doesn't end there. It also becomes an example that the people who still work on other projects will be expected to imitate in order to be similarly successful. Trying to preserve the unique qualities of a different brand will be seen as standing in the way of progress. And if a certain product doesn't really fit the mold, or if key staff members resist the new changes, management may decide to just stop making that product and focus their efforts elsewhere. This phenomenon occurs on a small scale in any company with one product that's notably more successful than the others, but it usually doesn't go beyond that. Sometimes, though, the flagship brand is so disproportionately successful that it ends up dwarfing the entire rest of the company. Konami and Valve are both companies that experienced this transformation, though admittedly with products other than video games. Valve had Steam, which started out as an experimental marketplace to, among other things, help market Valve's own video game creations. Now Steam is pretty much all Valve does, and the creative people who used to work there are gone. Steam was so profitable that actually making video games paled in comparison, and no one at Valve could justify focusing on game development when Steam was a faster and much less risky way to make money. 
For Konami, this dynamic worked in reverse. Konami used to be known as both a manufacturer of gambling machines and a video game developer slash producer. But after several embarrassing flops, Konami decided to leave video gaming behind and put its money on pachinko and slot machines. I'm not suggesting that this is the only reason Valve turned into the Steam Company or Konami abandoned video games. In Konami's case, a dysfunctional corporate culture was a major factor in the collapse of its video game division. And Valve, of course, had a serious impediment in the form of a major game franchise that no one had any idea how to finish. But these companies couldn't have afforded to abandon their old products if another more profitable line of business hadn't been there for them to move into. Other companies in the entertainment industry feel this pressure too. Pixar is an example that comes to mind. An animation studio that used to be known for unique original films has become a sequel factory dedicated to exploiting recognizable brands. A fan of Pixar's old films might well ask, why do they have to make Toy Story 4 instead of something new and exciting? But when a film sells a billion dollars worth of tickets, and you have a choice to either make a sequel to that or some totally new thing, any studio that rejects the sequel option is either unnaturally confident in its ability to sell new material to the public, or it's willing to pass up the chance to make another billion dollars. I'd like to believe that Nintendo's unique corporate culture is strong enough to resist the pressure of Pokémonetization, but for that to be true, the top brass in Nintendo would have to be promoting and preserving that culture. And they're not. Nintendo was not prepared for the death of its president, Satoru Iwata, in 2015. Unlike when Iwata himself took over from Hiroshi Yamauchi a decade and a half earlier, there was no time for a carefully planned transfer of power from an established boss to his preferred successor. It was a complete toss-up. Of the big names that were in the running for the chief executive position, there were two that particularly stood out in the articles I was reading at the time, Shigeru Miyamoto and Genyo Takeda, who represented the artistic and technical sides of the company, respectively. Takeda was the one I was rooting for. He was in many ways a protege of Gunpei Yokoi, one of my favorite not-sung-enough heroes of the game industry. Like Yokoi, Takeda had a knack for working with low-end hardware. He played a major part in developing both battery-based saving for NES games and the hardware for the Wii. Also like Yokoi, he was the driver behind quirky and original games, in his case Star Tropics and the Punch-Out! series. Miyamoto, of course, was Nintendo's most important game designer. If Takeda was a throwback to Yokoi, Miyamoto was a throwback to... well, himself since even back in the 80s he was already the lead artist at Nintendo. While Takeda was a technology whiz, Miyamoto was a design genius responsible for many of Nintendo's biggest franchises, along with more offbeat fare like Pikmin and Mole Mania. Incidentally, he was also Satoshi Tajiri's mentor and liaison with Nintendo while Pokémon was in development. So this was a serious rivalry, the result of which would determine the guiding philosophy of Nintendo for years to come. Miyamoto would have been a clear favorite for the job, except the presidential duties would have taken him away from game design. Takeda understood the nuts and bolts of Nintendo's production process better, but he was a relative unknown, with no reputation in the West at all. However, Nintendo had to make a decision one way or the other, so after several months of serious thinking, they decided to pick... Neither. Faced with the choice of having either the art department or the production line dominate Nintendo, the company instead went to... Marketing, tapping Tatsumi Kimishima, a man who has never designed a video game in his life. In fact, for most of his career, he worked in banking. He had been president of Nintendo of America from 2002 to 2006, but wasn't nearly as distinguished in that position as either his predecessor, Minoru Arakawa, or his more famous successor, Reggie fils Before that, he worked in finance for the Pokémon Company, and then became head of Nintendo's internal Pokémon division, an important job that likely gave him a major boost up the corporate ladder. Kimishima's rise wouldn't have been entirely unpredictable at the time. After all, Iwata made him managing director of Nintendo in 2013, so even though Takeda and Miyamoto were better known outside the company, he arguably had more experience making executive-level decisions. He was a financial expert, and importantly, he had overseen Nintendo's biggest media franchise during a period of enormous success and expansion. And yet, despite his qualifications, Kimishima wasn't destined to hold that presidential chair for long. Less than three years later, it was announced that he was stepping down in favor of another, even more obscure subordinate, Shuntaro Furukawa. Furukawa began his career as an accountant, and also rose through Nintendo's managerial ranks from a directorial position at the Pokémon Company. At first glance, Furukawa's qualifications are even less apparent than Kimishima's, but a few key points stand out. He's young, he speaks English fluently, and he wants Nintendo to push hard into the mobile game market. The first two points don't really make much of a difference in terms of how he does his job, but they matter a great deal if you're looking at image. And image is something Nintendo is very concerned with right now, in this period of upheaval with so many things changing. Nintendo has had as many new presidents in the last three years as it had in the previous 30. 
The gaming landscape is changing very quickly, and Nintendo's current management is more willing than ever before to change with it. But exactly what changes have they made? Let's take a look. One big change that seems to have gone mostly unnoticed happened back in 2015, when Kimishima combined Nintendo's two major in-house development teams, Entertainment Analysis and Development, and Software Planning and Development, into the new Entertainment Planning and Development division. Kimishima's press release about why he did this is quite illuminating, so I'm going to quote it here. We will integrate personnel who are involved in the development of software for Nintendo platforms and smart devices, in addition to work associated with effective utilization of character IP, and in order to create a structure that operates efficiently and rapidly, the Entertainment Analysis and Development Division and the Software Planning and Development Division will be consolidated into the newly established Entertainment Planning and Development Division. There's a lot in that brief statement. To begin with, Kimishima wanted both console games and smartphone games to come from the same development team, presumably to ensure thematic consistency across all of the platforms Nintendo develops for. Then he mentions effective utilization of character IP, or in other words, making games that will sell because of the appeal of Nintendo's branded characters, and not necessarily because they're good games. These are the kind of sentiments you'd expect from someone who has a background in marketing, who sees products in terms of how you pitch them, rather than how you make them. But it's the third point that's really kind of worrying. Efficiency and speed are not priorities that I would ever have expected Nintendo to focus on. I might expect that from a company like EA, which makes generic garbage like FIFA that's irrelevant a year after it comes out. But Nintendo always used to have quality as its number one priority. And if that takes longer than expected, at least the end product is something worth waiting for. This is, after all, the company whose greatest visionary once said, a delayed game is eventually good, but a rushed game is forever bad. Another big change we've seen at Nintendo over the last several years is a substantial increase in the number of remakes, ports, and greatest hits style compilations that it puts out, while new franchises and niche titles either haven't been made, or have been delegated to outside studios with minimal involvement from the core Nintendo team. Then of course there's the push into mobile game development, which Iwata was pretty solidly against, but Furukawa is most definitely for. He wants to build up a billion dollar mobile business for Nintendo, and plans to do it by having one massive hit that shakes up the whole market much like a certain other mobile game that's been cited by both Kimishima and Furukawa as a big influence on their business strategy. Hmm, it really makes you think. Kimishima's corporate restructuring and Furukawa's big plans for Nintendo's future didn't come out of nowhere. In fact, you could make a plausible case that the biggest inspiration in both cases was an example that was right at hand and very familiar to both of them, the Pokémon franchise. Game Freak is a company with just one large game development team that focuses on making sequels and remakes to a single uber-important franchise. Game Freak works efficiently and rapidly. There's never been a period of more than two years without either a mainline Pokémon game or a remake since 1996. Meanwhile, the Pokémon Company is a large organization dedicated to effectively utilizing character-based intellectual property. Pokémon started remaking older games in the franchise before it was a decade old, back in 2004 with Fire Red and Leaf Green, just like Nintendo has been doing recently with the Zelda franchise. Pokémon has all kinds of spin-offs, many of which are made by third-party studios. Pokémon became a massively successful mobile game in 2016, and made more than a billion dollars for its creator, Niantic. And two years after the Pokémon Company announces a Detective Pikachu spin-off movie, Nintendo happens to mention that they're working with Illumination to create a Mario feature film, which is something they haven't tried since 1993. With good reason, I might add. Pokémon is unquestionably a hugely successful franchise, the biggest in the world, in fact. And there's no doubt that both Nintendo and Game Freak have devoted lots of resources toward making Pokémon spin-offs, sequels, and merchandising deals. Not only is Pokémon itself growing at the expense of smaller franchises, but Nintendo has also restructured itself to make the most of its other massive franchises, like Mario, Zelda, and Smash Brothers, pushing the less popular brands even farther out of the spotlight, and sometimes starving them of resources completely. Nintendo is becoming more homogeneous and trimming its portfolio of properties, while also looking for new ways to exploit its biggest franchises. Instead of making the best games they can, Nintendo's management has its heart set on building up the strongest brands it can. And you can hardly blame them when a game like Pokemon Go, which has no story, bare-bones mechanics, and characters that everyone's seen before, is the most profitable Nintendo-branded product ever made. Considering that this is Nintendo's game plan for the future, is there any hope left for a fan of Nintendo's less prominent franchises? Or someone who wants to see new, fresh IP? <music> 
Actually, there is a reasonable chance that some parts of Nintendo will keep being themselves, despite the pressure of Pokémonetization. Specifically, the quasi-independent teams under Nintendo's umbrella, known as second-party developers. If you were a Nintendo fan about a decade ago, there's a pretty strong chance that at least one of your favorite franchises belongs not to core Nintendo, but to one of the second-party studios. If you're a big fan of the Mario and Luigi series, you have Alpha Dream to thank for it. If, like me, you thought Kirby's Epic Yarn and Yoshi's Woolly World were really charming, that was good feel. And I couldn't possibly list the number of amazing games made by HAL Laboratory, the original creators of Kirby and Smash Brothers. These are small companies, each with its own history and a unique portfolio of games. And taken as a whole, they tend to come up with more new ideas in each console generation than Nintendo does. At least, they do when Nintendo isn't putting them to work making mobile apps and racing games. Seriously, Nintendo, what the hell are you doing with Retro Studios? Anyway, the release of the Switch and Nintendo's new focus distracted a lot of attention away from the second-party studios, but in a way this is a good thing. Less attention means less pressure to tow the company line, and if the core team is focusing on exploiting current brands rather than making new ones, that just means that the smaller teams have a chance to be the ones to create new properties and get credit for it. None of them has the staff of Nintendo EPD or the immense popularity of Game Freak, but what they do have is an incentive to innovate. It's a tough challenge, certainly harder than making sequels, but I think they're up to it. I'm definitely more interested in what they make next than in Smash Ultimate or Luigi's Mansion 3. Nintendo is kind of like the apple of video games, or at least it was. They had a unique attitude toward design and marketing, and they stubbornly stuck to that attitude in the face of widespread criticism and even mockery. But their differences, far from sinking them financially, gave them a niche in the market that they were able to completely dominate. For Apple, this was MP3 players and later smartphones. For Nintendo, it was the portable video game market. Both companies were led by idiosyncratic executives who made innovation a major priority. Both companies had products that kept getting better and cheaper all the time. And both companies, precisely because they didn't chase every new technological trend, had a reputation for consistently pleasing their customers, however many they had. The success of the Nintendo Switch so far, and its extremely positive media coverage, have led a lot of people to predict smooth sailing for Nintendo over the next few years. But I'm not sure. It all makes me think back to the days of the Nintendo Wii. The Wii faced constant derision almost from the moment it was announced. People tore it apart for everything. Stupid name, stupid gimmick, underpowered hardware, and a lack of good third-party software. In general, it seemed like they were ragging on Nintendo because it didn't aim its product at the hardcore gamer market, like Sony and Microsoft later did. Were these people right? Well, if you go by financial success, that's a flat no. The Wii was Nintendo's best-selling home console of all time, and only marginally outsold by the super cheap and super accessible Game Boy, which was also around for longer. It didn't lag behind the PS3 and Xbox 360. In fact, Sony and Microsoft were later driven to copy the Wii's success, not the other way around. But despite the example of the Wii, Nintendo these days seems like it would rather be in Sony's or Microsoft's shoes. Managers like Furukawa seem to have learned some lessons from Iwata's failure with the Wii U, but they didn't learn anything from his successes. When Apple lost Steve Jobs, it stopped innovating. Its products started getting more derivative and more expensive, and right now it's in the middle of a creative slump. Instead of building up brand loyalty with innovation, it's cashing in the goodwill it has by selling its fans overpriced and underdeveloped products. Nintendo is basically doing the same thing with video games. Its fans have been inundated with shallow spin-offs and remakes that add almost nothing to the original experience. And if it keeps moving in the direction of Pokémonetization, it runs the risk of alienating everyone who isn't a massive fan of their biggest franchises. And if you don't think that's a problem, I'll leave you with one last statistic that you might find interesting. The Wii and the DS are Nintendo's two best-selling home and portable consoles, respectively. The Wii sold over 100 million units, and the DS over 150 million. The best-selling games for these consoles, by contrast, sold roughly 37 million and 30 million units, respectively. This means that the vast majority of console buyers didn't purchase the killer app for their console. And it's a safe bet that many of those customers didn't buy most of the high-profile releases that came out for the system. Killer apps have never sold Nintendo's most successful consoles. A variety of diverse and interesting content is what did that, along with good design and the user-friendliness that comes with not being hardcore. Nintendo can't afford to be like Game Freak, continually polishing up and reselling the same small number of franchises, because franchise power alone isn't what Nintendo's customers appreciate. Right now we live in a world of media consolidation. Movie studios are throwing their weight behind huge cinematic universes, and small entertainment companies are going out of business or being absorbed by conglomerates. 
It's understandable that in such an environment, people would see the decisions associated with Pokemonetization as inevitable. But an unrestrained obsession with a few media franchises is unhealthy and unsustainable. Anyone who's seen a love pillow can attest to that. If Nintendo keeps drifting toward the mainstream and relying on its tentpole franchises to make all the money, I think it's headed for a rocky future. But let's assume I'm wrong, and this new strategy proves immensely profitable for Nintendo. In that case, the result would be even more unfortunate. It would leave Nintendo as something a lot like Konami or Valve, a successful and profitable company that lots of people patronize and no one really cares about. It would mean making derivative, mediocre games for an audience that will buy just about anything as long as it has the right characters and the right marketing. Pokemon's already a bit like that, but it could go much, much further. And if Nintendo's management isn't bothered by that prospect, then I've overestimated them. I really hope that isn't the case.